Okay. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome back. Uh, very happy you made it this far. I uh, hope you learned something. Um, before I get started, a couple announcements. So, after the talk, there will be a tea time at second floor. Feel, please feel free to uh, join the tea time. Uh, and. Uh, Secondly, I will still be here until July 14th. So if you have any questions or if you have anything you'd like to talk about, feel free to stop by my office 204B. Okay, I'll be happy to talk more about with you until July 7th, 14th. Okay. So I'm not just, after the talk, will be gone, all right? I will still be here. So feel free to uh, stop by and talk to me, OK? OK, so let's move on. Today, we are going to talk about uh, some big picture. So first, maybe 10, 20 minutes, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what has been done in persistent homology what is the challenging uh, problem, right? Um, and then I'm going to show you some applications that uh, my collaborator and I have been working on. Okay, so it's going to be two parts. All right. So the first thing I'm going to mention is there are some reference uh, book. If you like to know more details, there are some books you can take a look. The earliest one is by uh, Thomas and Constantine and this person. The title is Computational Homology. And this book is the oldest one. This book is published in 2004. So it only covers until homology theory. It has no persistent homology at all. So, but this book is interesting because it takes approach of um, Differential equations. So at the end of this book, if you like to know how this applies to the differential equation, dynamical systems, this is the book you can take a look. Okay? And this book is written in very detailed mathematics. If you like to learn more about uh, classic homology theory, this is the one to take a look. And there were there are two books not considered as the best out there. But be aware, those two books are very short. It's like 100 pages. And it's very difficult to read because it contains a lot of information. Um, so, but it has everything. So if you like to know uh, some, some book, those two books are a very nice book. But be aware, it's not an easy book to read. And there's a review paper, there are like 50 pages by Garner Carson, one of the founder of persistent homology. Uh, he wrote a review paper. So this is also a very good uh, reference, introduction to persistent homology. Okay. Right. So the first thing I want to mention is the multi-parameter persistence. So at this point, what you have seen is persistent homology. So you have a parameter that gives you the filtration. So what if now you have two parameters, right? So that this is come from a protein structure, I believe. So this structure depends on the curvature and the radius. So you know, based on the curvature, you have this uh, shape, right? So the natural question is, well, can one extend the per persistent homology to this multi-parameter persistent homology. Okay, so this is one step uh, further. And there was a work in 09, but the theory wasn't, wasn't very complete. Okay, so if you're interested, you should take a look. The main point there is it will involve the polynomial on the rings. And this two parameter will involve two uh, polynomial on two variables. Okay? 
So this is a very challenging problem in, um, in this community. And later, not until recently, 2017, this uh, researcher, Isra Miller, he is from Duke University. Uh, he developed, well, he claims his uh, development for multi-parameter is, is, is the correct one, okay? And in order to do that, he has to, you know, really just to rebuild everything in order to fit the correct framework. So he wrote like 100 pages of one paper you know, to build this theoretical framework of multi-parameter persistence. And so far, there is only one software that can do multi-parameter uh, persistence. Right? It's called Rift. Okay. And it has some limitation. Okay. So um, it's a current research project. All right. And the very big uh, persistent homology, persistent diagram type of research comes down to uh, what we call the summary of persistent diagram, okay? So here is the usual pipeline. Suppose you have a data. Okay? Data may live in high dimensional, D dimensional, whatever, and you use persistent diagram, you use persistent homology in order to study the shape of this data. Then you have a persistent diagram like this, right? And now what you want is to study like machine learning, or you want to study the statistics uh, on the persistent diagram because you want to do maybe classification, maybe you want to do uh, object detection, so on. Okay. So one very common way is to somehow summarize the persistent diagram. Persistent diagram is a very weird space. It is just a matrix space. It's not Banach space. It's not finite dimensional. It's infinite dimensional. It's a very weird odd space. That's why people try to summarize this very odd space to a vector, to the Euclidean space, so you can do like support vector machine, principal analysis, or you know, neural network and so on and so forth. Okay? So currently, a, a major push is in here. Can one extract some meaningful vector from persistent diagram. Okay. And this, it, uh, this, uh, this figure is copied from this work from our neighbor, uh, one of the universities in Japan. Okay. And here are two very famous ones. The one is called persistent landscape. This is the most natural way to represent the persistent diagram. But it, it still has the drawback. The drawback is this is in a, this is in Banach space, well Hilbert space. This is the function. So persistent landscape, what happened is you have a persistent diagram and transform the persistent diagram to like a functional space, like here. Okay? So that's a way to summarize the persistent diagram. And another one is called persistent image. I didn't put the name. It's called the persistent image. So you have a persistent diagram. This group of people, they transform the persistent diagram into an image. So it's like a, a vector now. This is the function space. This is the vector. So from there, you will be able to do some machine learning techniques. And another group of people was working on the kernel. Can you do some kernel estimates on the persistent diagram? OK. OK. And there is another direction, right? We try to put the connection between the statistics and TDA and persistent homology because we, we want to do machine learning. Statistics will be the foundation. So there are a group of people that are working on how to do, for instance, the confidence interval on the persistent diagram. So in this work, you have a persistent diagram. They separate, they give you a statistical measurement on how to separate the robust signal from the true signal. So they give you a confidence interval. So 
so far you can see the work is 2014. It is still uh, lacks a lot of statistical foundation. So if you're interested, uh, this, this is the approach to, to, to take a look. Okay? And this is the paper I mentioned. Persistent diagram is a very, very odd space. You can take a look at this paper. It will show you the definition of the persistent diagram space. Then they will be able to define a probability major on the persistent diagrams. Right? So it will, uh, very beautiful theory, but the space is very odd. You can uh, take a look. And once they have the probability major, they were able to calculate the mean of, suppose you have the hundred of different persistent diagrams, you want to take the means. There will be a method to take the means, right? In theory, in practice, it's very, very difficult to do it. Okay. And there is another group of people, again, try to study the foundation of the persistent diagram. Try to study the statistics of the persistent diagram. Uh, one big approach is to study the random complexes. Right? So let me give you a very simple question. Um, suppose you have a images, right? random images. I create this image by random. Uh, maybe I have some probability this pixel will be there some probability this pixel will not be there. All right, so you create a random image. A very natural question to ask is, what is the expected Betty number of these random images? Okay? And that's the questions they try to answer uh, in those work. Okay? So this is a very, very cool uh, idea because in principle, they're trying to understand the noise and how the noise present in persistent diagrams. So there are some, uh, some work in, in there. And in fact, use the, the code I showed you last time. You will be able to do your own experiment. You can run, you can create the random cubicle complexes, and then you can run a lot of different persistent homology statistics. You can see some results, okay? But to prove it, it's a very challenging problem. And there is another group of people using uh, this thing called sheeps. So this is way beyond my comfort zone. But I know it's something about the category theory. Right? So this is uh, people in uh, pain. Uh, the big people is Robert Grace and, and his student Justin Curry. They use sheaves and co-sheaves to study the signal processing. And I have to warn you, this book is, again, a very short book, and it's very, very condensed. It has a lot of information. If you're interested, you can take a look. And also, this author give, gives the online lecture on how to use sheaves, tutorial on sheaves in data analysis. If you're interested, you can take a look. There are five lectures. It will take you from homology, the sheaves, and how to use in the signal processing. Okay. Okay. So I, here I'm just throwing you a lot of big information just for you to read and you know, hope you can get some interest. All right, and here is some application. There are a lot of applications done uh, using persistent homology. For instance, uh, People study the material science, use persistent homology, and study the prose media, use persistent homology, and some people use study the bi uh, brain structure, and some also some people study uh, you know fluid dynamics, use the persistent homology, and you know study the protein structures, and study the brain network. Right? So this list is not exhausted, there are a lot. I'm just taking some of them, a few of them, okay? Okay. All right, so that's very big picture, all right? And now I'm going to show you uh, some actual work, all right? So the data analysis that has been carried by myself and my collaborators, 
Okay. Uh, so here is some of my cooperators. The main one is my former um, postdoc mentor, Sarah Day. He, she is at College of William Mary. And uh, Kaylin Keegan, uh, she is not in Copenhagen right now, but she is the one who collected the data. And uh, Zoe collected data too. And some people from uh, Harvard and my former colleague and my undergraduate research students and my graduate uh, students. Okay. So the first thing I'm going to show you is real cool. It's called a fern, right? So this is my collaborator, Caitlin. And what she's trying to understand, she is the climatologist, right? So she goes out to North Pole and South Pole to collect the data. And what data she collect uh, is this big ice sample you're looking at, right? So the very top is the snow, and the very bottom of the column is the ice, right? And what is fern? Fern is somewhere in between the ice and the snow. So everything in here, in general, is called fern. Okay. So this is uh, this is fern. And why do we want to study uh, fern? Okay. So <clears throat> one interesting question is: let's see if I have there. One interesting question is. Oops, is the following. So this is the firm. You're going up, you have the snow, and on the very top of your uh, ice or firm column, it's like the snow. It's very soft. If you ever touch snow, top is very, very snow. And if you go very deep, then this ice become very, very compact, very, very hard. And what's in the middle is what we're trying to understand. But here's the point. Um, first, the big question is they, they only know this by cartoon. So they don't know what exactly how this fern structure changes. Right? So in a way, they know on the top it's very loose structure. So you may have a lot of different tunnels. And in the very bottom, you may see a lot of air bubbles, that sort of thing. Okay? And most importantly, once you have air bubble, they create, they create a gas difference. Right? So the gas in this air bubble and the gas in the top air bubble can be, the difference can be like a thousand years ago. Right? So because the air is trapped inside the ice, that air store the very important information. I can show you maybe a thousand years ago what was the composition of the air. Right? So that's what they're trying to understand. They're trying to understand the structure of the sample. How does the structure changes in terms of the depth? And maybe try to detect uh, where the pores is closing off, where you have the air bubble. Okay. All right, good. Any questions? So let me show you the data. Go. All right. So the one on the left that you're looking at is the seven meter depth. The one on the right is 17 meter depth, okay? So this is the micro CT scan. So it's a 2D slices, but you are looking at is a three dimensional object. And to give you some details, this image is 500 by 500, 500 by 500, and there are almost 800 stacks of them. So you stack it, you become a three-dimensional image. Okay? And our goal is to study, study this sample, right? use topology. Okay? Okay. Because the way they describe the problem to us, we feel like you know, topology has a really good chance. Because if you think about just the topology way, here you, you're going to see a lot of air bubbles. So you might be able to use beta 2 to quantify that. Right? So 
So that's a very natural. Uh, I think we are really lucky to have this data set. All right. The first thing we're going to see from this data is, well, the first thing we, we do is, uh, can we find a meaningful binary image? Right? So that's our collaborator ask us, right? because um, in their lab, they have this machine. What they do is they will take this micro scan sample, grayscale sample, they just produce a binary image using certain threshold. But, but the threshold might be sensitive to the noise. Maybe the threshold you pick uh, very sensitive to the noise. And therefore, they wonder if there is a meaningful way to produce the binary images. Okay? So the very first thing we do is, is to to do this automatic thresholding method. It's a very simple way. Uh, if you look at the automatic thresholding method out there, it's a very traditional, very classical way in image processing, okay? They all based on some histogram of the pixels, based on some entropy of the pixel, but there is a very few method based on the topology of the underlying images, all right? That's why we came here and give them the PD thresholding method. So our idea is very simple. Right? Suppose you have this persistent diagram and we, we learn over this past two weeks, we know that the baiting number in this pink box, well, one more time. The generators in this pink box is going to be the baiting number at that current threshold. This threshold will be 128. Okay, so, so can we find a meaningful uh, threshold? So you, if you look at the persistent diagram, that will give you a hint on how to choose, you know, maybe a good threshold. So for instance, you may be able to choose 100 because, because if you think about those are the noisy generator, if you include the threshold at 50, you're going to see a lot of... Um, a lot, a lot of noise, if you think about this as noise. So our idea is very simple. We try to avoid those clusters because those are the generator that help you form the main structure, but it's really just transition. So we don't want to include those parts. We want to include, um, we want to choose the threshold so that avoid the noisy generators, but also capture the robust so we came up with this uh, optimum uh, scheme based on the uh, based on this objective function. Okay. Okay. So here's what we produce. Uh, this is the persistent diagram for for this three-dimensional image you just saw. Okay. Oops. So this is a three-dimensional image. So you're going to have, remember, three-dimensional. You have a zeros level, first level, and a second level. And our algorithm was able to choose a threshold value, I forgot, 120, 120. It should be 120, I forgot the label. But yeah, but look at this, right? So our threshold was picked so that it avoids Lows noisy generator, but keeps the robust one. Okay. So our threshold method, you know, produced the threshold, and not only our method produced the threshold, but also we produce the baiting number. So whenever they use this method, they have this information. They can see the threshold. They can also see the baiting number information. Okay. Good. So this is just another slide. You know, if you want to know what is the baiting number of this structure, yeah, it's very difficult to just look at by eyes, but you know, we can use persistent homology to help us. Cool. All right. Let me talk about this first. So. <clears throat> 
The first application of this thing is uh, we think we capture some meaningful information. So <clears throat> the red curve is the 7 meter, the blue curve is the 17 meters. So let me explain how I get these figures. So now instead of 3D, 3D image, so now I only calculate as a 2D slice. So I apply PD threshold method for each 2D slice. So what I'm trying to do is to somehow detect the changes of Betty number in terms of the slices, 2D slices, okay? And we capture the threshold and we also capture the Betty number, beta zero in this case. So what we observe is that in 17 meters, the Betty number is roughly in the 60, right? And the Betty number for seven meters is roughly in the 20s, okay? So if just looking at this, you might be able to say, oh, it looks like seven meter is somehow different than the 17 meters sample, just looking at the 2D slices. And also, what we discover is there is a very big jump after certain, like 695 around this age. There's a really big jump in the seven meters. Okay. And, uh, And if you look at the original, look at the right, look at the right one. This is the sample we are looking at. And notice at the end, it seems like a very big uh, changes. Wait for it, wait for it. Oh, there you go. Looks like you have a very big thing and then suddenly become not very nice, okay? So this sudden changes we captured in our method as well. And we asked our collaborator what's going on there and she told us, well, that is a seasonal layer. Uh, looks like a seasonal layer. So, you know, this method is promising. We were able to capture some um, some information they are looking at, they are looking for, okay? Okay, good. Okay. And now, another thing I want to mention is, is this. This is a very simple calculation. Right, so I have a very different depth sample. I have a seven meter, 17 meter, 23 meters, up until 78 meters, right? So if you look at those samples, this is just one snapshot. This is really three-dimensional objects, but this is just one snapshot. And we calculate, uh, we calculate, now we calculate three-dimensional images, and then we calculate the Betty number, roughly speaking. And what we observe is, as you go deeper, as you go deeper, this is the beta one, the number of tunnels. This fits our intuition. On the top, you're gonna see a lot of um, beta one, so you have a lot of um, number of components. And as you go deeper, the tunnel becomes less and less. Right? So we, when you go very deep, this tunnels, you, you won't be able to see it. Right? So all the tunnels are closing off, okay? So this might be helpful for them because uh, this is, somehow telling them there is a big jump, uh, 400, 200, here this is really just nine or 10 less than that, right? So from this quantitative study, we might be able to say some idea about when the pore is closing off, okay? And here this presents a uh, challenges, okay? So I, I forgot to mention. The challenge in here is I have to resize the sample to 200 by 200 by 200. So that's a main difficulty in persistent homology computation. So far, memory is the really big issue. Right? So this computation was done on my, on my computer. Uh, MacBook, 16 gigabyte, and that's the maximum uh, size I can do, 200 by 200 by 200. 
And you may think that's a really, really small image if you think about this. So this is a current research project on so many persistent homology group. They're trying to build the software that is memory efficient. So the software I'm using is one of the best one, is the DIFA. But still, it's memory intensive, okay? You can think about the, the difficulty. This is more like the four dimensional problem because this is a grayscale image. Right? Grayscale image gives you one more dimension. So this is like a four dimensional problem. So this is a really memory intensive in persistent homology. Okay. Oh, there we go. It's right here. Okay. All right. Any questions? All right. The next uh, application is to study the human red blood cell. Okay. So this is a joint work with Madalena in uh, Harvard Medical School. Okay. So here is the the, the question and the and the data. We have we want to understand uh, human red blood cell. Right, so we all know that the new cell means the cell that's newly born from our blood system that can carry much more oxygen than the old cell. Old cell means the cell that's going to die very soon. Okay, so the typical life cycle of the red blood cell is uh, six months. Right, so, um, so in this study, we were trying to understand quantitatively what is the difference between the old cell and the new cell and why new cell can carry more oxygen than the old cell you know uh, so there must be some difference right? so we try to study uh, this okay so here's the data I'm gonna have a 13 different new cells and then 13 old cells so those are produced by the lab the medical the Harvard labs they were able to you know, identify and label those 13 different cells as new and those 13 different cells as old. All right, so those are the job they do. And this is an image data. This is a time series data. So there will be a 5,000 frames for each cell. So the data will look like this. So what you're looking at, this is one of the new cell, and this is another new cell, and this is the old cell, this is the another old cell. Okay. So this is a time series data, and we're trying to understand the difference of those data. Play it one more time. Okay. So earlier, uh, in the early 19th century, or 20, early 20th century, sorry, an experiment that discovered, you know, human red blood cell has this movement, rapid movement. If you look at this one more time, you will see it, it's a rapid movement. And they call this thing a flickering. Originally, our motivation of this work is by these people in Harvard, they have this hypothesis, right? The claim is complexity is a sign of the health, right? So if you will be able to measure the somehow complexity of this time series, um, you know, that's a sign of the health because they have the study on uh, baby, right? So they have this uh, healthy baby and the illness baby. They study their heartbeat, then discover the healthy heartbeat for the baby is more complex. And then the illness baby's heartbeat is very regular, right? So that's the, 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 the hypothesis they're trying to, to do, the complexity, the sign of the health. So they try to you know, study this, 
they want to somehow say something about the complexity of this cell and then maybe say something about new cell uh, is more complex than the old cell. Okay. So there has been a study on how to quantify two different cells by roughness. So this is a very simple measurement. This is just um, root mean square, something like that, like the standard deviation, right? So it will just show you uh, how rough of that cell is. But you can see this is very early work, but it also it's going to be problematic because um, because it doesn't take care of the spatial information. You just if I shuffle this thing, you will still get the same uh, same 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 number, but the cell might be a lot different. Okay. So that's the thing I just mentioned, the complexity and the roughness. So our goal in this study is to, study, to maybe to come up with a topological roughness. Maybe it's more global. Right? It's not just um, some single number. Maybe we want to take uh, more spatial information into account. And maybe we want to talk a little bit about the complexity. Okay. So this is a persistent homology study, right? So the first thing uh, we do is we calculate the persistent diagrams. Right? We calculate a persistent diagram, and this is one snapshot, one typical um, persistent diagram for the new cell and for the old cell. Okay. Let's take a look for a moment. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I don't know what's going on here, right? So let's move on to see what more we can talk about this. Right? So the first thing we do is a very global study, right? So I calculate the lifespan. I hope you all remember what is the lifespan. Lifespan simply means if you have a coordinate, you just take the difference, right? The death coordinate minus the birth coordinate, that's the lifespan. Good. So I calculated the lifespan for each, for each persistent diagram. So that becomes a one-dimensional measurement. So I can plot the histogram of the lifespan, right? So that's what I do here. And I collect all of them in this single uh, histogram. So this is a really big overview. So the interesting thing is right here. What we discover is for the old cell, it looks like there is a gap between 0.5 and 0.7. Some magic gap, gap. we don't know. But it's there. Okay. So the most, most generator is less than 0.5. Right? And few generator is beyond 0.7. This is the lifespan. lifespan. Okay? But for the new cell, what you see is, you know, it looks like the generator is spread out all over the place. You have the short life generator, you also have the long life generator, you also have the mid life generator throughout the spectrum. Okay? So that's already just calculating the persistent diagram, already we will be able to see some uh, differences. And hopefully maybe, uh, maybe we can ask them for some explanation, but this is what we discover, discover in the first step. Okay, and now the next step, the next thing we discover is the number of generators. Okay. So let me remind you what is the number of generators. So what I do so far is very, very simple statistics. So the number of generator means you know, the number of blue points in, in this diagram, the number of blue points in this diagram. That's called the generators. 
So what I do in the second discovery is if I just looking at the number of generators for each cell, for each frame, number of generators, we see some differences. Okay, and this is the box plus for the new cell and the old cell. Let's just look at the top one. Top one is, this is H0 and this is H1. So it looks like the old cell is in 200 spectrum, it looks like there. And for the new cell, roughly speaking, all the cell is in 500 generators, okay? And for the H1, you have 600 generators, you have almost twi twice a thousand generators, okay? And this is what we discover, um, just using this very simple measurement, we discover, you know, the number of generators uh, is a little bit different, okay? So what does that mean, right? What does that mean? Well, if you think about one dimensional case, 1D case, in 1D case, a generator, if you have a generator, that really means a minimum maximum pair, right? So if you look at here, how I calculate the persistent diagram, the sub-level set method, you have this ground level, you're moving up, that's how you can calculate a persistent diagram. So one mean max pair will refer to one point here, one mean max pair refer to another generator there, right? So, so this might be able to explain what happened on the line, the red blood cell. Right? So for the new cell, there are more, more generators, so that means there are more mean max pair. So if you think about as a function, there may be more um, uh, yeah. Right. So for the new cell, you might see more like this for the new cell. And for the old cell, it's less min max pair, so it's flatter in the old cell. Okay. So this is what, uh, what we discover you know, purely from the data. Okay. Okay. So perhaps this is the way to quantify the roughness, right? So, you know, you can use this topological method to say this is the way to say this is rougher than the old cell, okay? Good? Okay, let's move on. Okay, now the next, right, so uh, this coming back for several times, I hope you get more familiar with this. One more thing I'm going to show you is, all right, at this point, this is the same exact figure I showed you before. <clears throat> I hope that convinced you something, right? So for instance, in the first result I showed you, the O's, this is a new cell, or well, that's a spectrum. So it looks like, it looks like for the new cell, it seems like there are two clusters. And for the old cell, there seems like generators everywhere. And uh, we can study that too. So now we study a different perspective of persistent diagram. Now instead of lifespan, I study B plus D over two. Right? So let me give you one more insight. One more insight. So this is the first value, this is the death value. D minus D, this is the lifespan. And we all know this very well. Lifespan tells you the fee how the feature persists, right? The, the larger this number is, the more likely the feature is robust. But what, what about D plus B? D plus B over 2. This thing is called the midlife generator, midlife coordinate. Okay. So what is the midlife coordinate, right? So this thing somehow tells you the location. Okay. 
it has nothing to do with the lifespan. The lifespan tells you robustness of the feature. This midlife coordinate tells you the location where the feature is born and die, takes loss into account. Right? So it tells you the location. So if we do the lifespan histogram, this reveals something. If you look at this, the top panel is for the new cells. So it looks like all of the generator looks like they're all located in the lower end. Okay? And for the old cell, it looks like all the generator spread out. Okay. Can we further quantify this? Okay. Well, again, we're using a very classic tradition statistical variability to capture that. So here I'm studying coefficient of variance, okay, CV, and skewness. This is for the one-dimensional distribution, and kurtosis, the fourth moment from the mean. Okay? And skewness tells you whether a distribution is symmetric or not. All right? And kurtosis is a little uh, tricky to explain, but roughly speaking, is measure of the outliers. And uh, this thing measure the dispersion. It's, uh, this is the standard deviation divided by the sample mean. Right? So that tells you how the distribution is dispersed. Okay. And uh, in 2010, one of my former colleagues and his best friend, they study this very simple, well, not simple, very classic uh, relation between skewness, ketosis, and coefficient of variance. So let me just use CV, SK, and KU to represent that. So they discover this very nice picture, right? So this is, this is CV coordinates, this is skewness coordinates, right? So they discover, you know, like the beta distribution is all in this regime and some exponential distribution, and there is some inverted beta distribution. So different color represent a different region of the distribution, the classical one, the most used uh, distribution. Similarly, this is ketosis on the x-axis, and that's the skewness. So very simple, not simple, very fundamental study. So we use the idea. We, we use the idea. This is what happened, right? So for each frame, I have a persistent diagram, like you see. And for each persistent diagram, I can calculate the midlife, the histogram of the midlife coordinates. And for each distribution, I can then calculate the CV, SK, and KU. Good? Good. So what happened here? So I crossed down a lot of information. Right, so originally I have an image. This is a frame of some pixel number. I somehow crush it to a persistent diagram. I summarize this frame by persistent diagram. And I further reduce the persistent diagram information to this histogram. Okay? And I want to understand the histogram and I further reduce to these three numbers. So I have this. Um, image here all comes down to these three numbers. Okay? And that has the meaning in these uh, images. Okay? And this is what we discover. Uh, blue is the old cell. Remember how many points we have? Each point, each point is CVSK is one point. So how many points do I have? I have 13 multiplied by 5,000 old cell point. And then I have for the new cell, I have 13 multiplied by 500. And this is what happened. Oops. This group, 13 multiplied by 5,000. This group, 13 multiplied by 5,000. And this is uh, what we discover, you know, seems like a very clear separation between the new cell and the old cell, okay? 
And here I try to put some reference, but you know, those are not, not relevant at this moment. Okay. Because originally I thought I can, if I can find whether this is located in certain regime, perhaps we can say uh, maybe O cell is better modeled by certain distribution. But just looking at this figure, it cross over a lot of different uh, distribution. So it's still an ongoing project. But at least we see this is a clear separation from the old cell and the new cells. Okay. And there is a another puzzle we like to ask is it seems like there is a support. Right? There's a line on the line here, because somehow this, yeah, it looks like you know, the data will never go below this line for some reason. So, um, that's the thing we try to understand as well. And another thing, my colleague brought this up, is it will be interested to see uh, how this, you know, because this is really a continuum process, right? This is a new cell, this is the old cell. Perhaps if we have enough data, you might be able to see from the red region migrate to the blue region, right? So that's, um, if we have enough data, that might be able to see it, okay? Good. And then the next one is the skewness and ketosis, right? Well, in this case, it is not clear whether you have the separation between the new cell and the old cell, okay? But, but this is a time series data, right? So far, I take, I, I crush the, the time information. I just throw everything into here, correct? So I hope I can have some time information so here's what happened. <clears throat> this is not the time information, not yet, but it's uh, one step further from before. What I do is, what I discover is, it looks like if you look at one particular cell, not here, one particular cell will be in here. Okay. One particular cell will have like a linear relation, whereas for the old cell, it looks like the relation SK and KU has no linear relation. Okay? And this very simple calculation shows that, right? So this is the correlation coefficient between, um, between each cell. Okay? And you can see there should be a 13 dot on the top. So for a new cell, they all very close to one, which means they follow the linear relation here. Whereas the old cell, they do not follow the linear relation. Okay, and this thing here is the theoretic lower bound for, for skewness and ketosis. Okay, questions? And there is a justification why I do this. There has been a study, <clears throat> I didn't include it here, but there has been a study on uh, skewness and ketosis. So um, people study stock, stock and market, people study fluid dynamics. They discover in certain complex dynamics, some certain chaos dynamics, like stock market and fluid dynamics, <clears throat> Skewness and ketosis follow some quadratic relation. And this is what we discover here. We discover our new cell follow the quadratic relation where the old cell does not follow the quadratic relation. Okay. Good. And uh, any questions? Good. All right. So the last thing I want to mention is um, uh, this is my university, all right? So we have really new program uh, 
So if you are interested in um, studying abroad, you may want to consider my school. And if you like to talk, uh, you know, about more our school or maybe just study abroad in general, you know, feel free to talk to me after a while. I'll be uh, more than happy to talk to you. Okay. And thank you very much for this past two weeks. And I really hope you've learned something about topological data analysis. And um, yes, thank you very much. And I will take any questions you may have. Thank you.